Hello and welcome to VMware Explore 2023 here in Las Vegas. Mm. Thank you very much for joining us uh, in the room here uh, for this panel on responsible AI. Uh, what role should humans play? Uh, also, thank you to those who are joining us online. Uh, we look forward to your contributions and questions as we progress through. Um, so we've heard a lot in this event about the excitement and power of private AI and what any organization can now do to innovate with this incredible new technology paradigm that, that's being enabled. Um, but to paraphrase Jurassic Park, um, we've now spent so much time thinking about whether we could. We also need to think about whether we should. And so the panel today, we'll be uh, discussing what role should humans play in terms of ethical adoption of these powerful new uh, technologies. Um, I want to start off by being very transparent about something. When we do these panels at VMware, we want to make sure we have a very comprehensive set of perspectives across any topic to be discussed. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that we do not have any AI services on our panel today. Um, I did ask an AI if it wanted to be on the panel, but it just played me music from Spotify. <laughs> so uh, it's just humans, I'm afraid. Um, but what humans we have. Uh, so let me introduce the panel. Meredith Broussard, um, Associate Professor uh, at the Institute of Journalism in New York University, uh, author of several books, including uh, More Than a Glitch, Issues with Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech. Uh, and her academic research has contributed a huge amount to uh, our understanding of how we can use these technologies as a force for good. Meredith, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And next to Meredith, of course, we have Chris Wolf, uh, Vice President of VMware AI Labs, uh, the Wolf of VMware apparently. <laughs> um, previously, he was Chief Research and Innovation Officer in the VMware Office of the CTO, and before that, Research Vice President at Gartner. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, at the end, uh, Karen Silverman, a very proud founder and CEO of the Cantalus Group, um, an incredible track record, uh, member of the uh, World Economic Forum uh, um, Institute for ethics uh, for, yeah, for expertise and experts, yeah. innovation and experts uh, for, for that, and also for the Global AI Council. Um, a tremendous entrepreneurial background as well as a remarkably successful legal background. Karen, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and I'm your moderator. I'm Richard Munro from the BMA Office of the CTO, and I can't compete with those backgrounds, so we'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> so maybe to, to kick us off. Um, let's start with a really basic one, because I, I think it's worth a level set. Um, Meredith, could you just answer for the room, what is AI and what isn't AI? Well, Richard, thank you for asking that, because I love to start with definitions. I, when we go into meetings about artificial intelligence, people are still a little confused about what AI is and isn't. So I always find it's really good to start with definitions in every single meeting. Uh, and the easiest way to explain it, uh, I've found, is that AI is just math. It's very complicated, beautiful math. People are always thinking about the Terminator, right? <laughs> people are thinking about Star Trek, people are thinking about Star Wars, uh, and it's really important to, uh, to emphasize what's real about AI as opposed to what's imaginary. Uh, and another way that I like to describe AI uh, is its pattern reproduction. So what we do when we make an AI system, a machine learning system, is we take a whole bunch of data, as much data as we can get from anywhere, usually scraped from the internet, uh, and we feed it into the computer and we say, computer, make a model. The computer makes a model. The model shows the mathematical patterns in the data. And then we can use that model for a number of amazing things. We can make decisions, we can make predictions, we can generate new text, we can generate new images, we can generate new audio, right? Uh, but all of the biases of the data of the real world uh, are reflected in the data we're using to train the model, and therefore the model is also going to reproduce certain biases that are pre-existing. Makes sense. Thank you for that. That's a, a great um, context setting. Um, so I guess when we think about what role should humans play, in my head there's, there's two layers to this, two main layers. There's <clears throat> what role should humans play in an organization that wants to embrace the capabilities that AI offers, so an organizational concept? 
And then we think about specific AI use cases. We're going to use AI to do this thing. And there's what role should humans play in our ability to do that thing successfully, eth including ethically. Successful is including ethics. Um, perhaps to kick us off, Chris, you have just done this uh, here at VMware you know, for, for the past period, um, setting up VMware AI Labs not only building these capabilities into our solutions that we've all been hearing about, but, but making AI work for VMware as well. Maybe you could start us off by describing what was your approach, what kind of things did you implement at the organizational level? Yeah, there's a lot there, and, and uh, just a side comment. I, I want to take Meredith with me to all of my meetings. That is the <laughs> best explanation of AI I've ever heard. So Thank I, you. Let's, uh, hopefully this is recorded. That was excellent. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot that we've had to uh, navigate through uh, in, inside VMware. So you know, our organization is guiding the, the strategy outbound, uh, the consumption of services internally, and how we're integrating AI into our products. Uh, so we, we, we try to break down AI into what we call the three pillars, which is smarter businesses. That's how we're helping our customers. Smarter products and services, that's AI in our products. And then third is smarter VMware. And for us, especially as things took off, what we wanted to do from our CTO and our chief information security officer is come up is come with some guidelines very early on that they can send out. Because what I was getting uh, quite frequently several months ago were all of these requests to review particular chat GPT integrations with products. And it was basically, hey, Chris, what do you think about this? And I'm like, what do you think about no? <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. No more. No. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> jokes are not allowed. Uh, I, I will not do that anymore. Okay. So, so, and the really, the, I mean, the, the challenge I think sometimes with with AI, with AI is that if you look at a part of the, if you look at the solution in isolation, you're not, uh, you're not, uh, you don't have the breath to say, well, what are the other implications? And the reason we were saying no to these Chat GPT integrations was because they could in turn violate the privacy and compliance mandates that our customers have. So therefore, we cannot do these things in products uh, in the way that some folks would desire. Uh, so, so that was one thing. And, and since then, we've had uh, we formed an AI council in the company to provide some guidelines. We've uh, uh, started to offer our own internal AI services that we have vetted. And, and we've been very careful in, in how we've done this. And also, I would say we've been human because uh, we were discussing this a little bit before the panel started. There's a lot all of us collectively just don't know. You know, there's a lack of industry standards on how to approach things like contracts and how we work with customers around artificial intelligence. So we're even asking questions with our customers as if they're peers. Like, well, what, what are your best practices? Here's kind of what we figured out. So in some ways, we feel that we're all in this together. But... I think the last thing I'll mention here, Richard, is that you know, we really wanted to lead as well with our ethical principles. And you know, for VMware, AI ethics is really important. We want to understand, you know, as we're using AI, the, uh, how the model is trained. We, we want to understand what are the data sources that have actually fed into the model. Does the model have bias? Can we root that out? And these have also been really important research topics for us as well, is we want to be able to uh, help customers to understand correctness of AI as well as explainability of AI results so that they can understand where, the, where they're coming from. And these are areas that we want to add to. So there's a lot more I can talk about, Richard. Let me just stop there. But uh, we are being very mindful internally and externally in terms of how we're approaching AI. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Karen, I mean, you know, that was a, a kind of a brief overview of the extent of things we've done. How does that sound based on your experience of what other organizations are doing or your opinion on what organizations should be doing? Yeah. Um, well, first, I would say that it sounds um, very forward and, and industry leading to, to already have a council set up and running and advising both internally and externally. Um, we're getting a lot of requests for that sort of advice. And what's interesting is there's no one flavor right, for, for what these AI councils should look like. They're very contextual. We've probably helped architect and set up maybe five or six of them in very different industries and some within the same industries. And, and they really have to be a reflection of corporate values or organizational values to begin with and then work with it. I, I say like in this space, there are like a lot of Apollo 13 moments, right, if we're going to keep with the movies. Mm -hmm. um, 
which is you're dealing with the stuff that's in the box on your desk, right? And, right. and the resources you have and the people and aptitudes and skill sets that you have. So part of where humans come in is, is at the level of management anyway, as you're describing it, um, understanding who you, who, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and how you can work with that to do the best you can um, in light of the humans that you are and that you're dealing with, right? Um, and then I would, I would add to, to, to Meredith's great definition, you know, I think humans are very important, and particularly with generative AI, which completely democratized access to the problem statements or the, the framing. So what it used to be that the, the, there was a fairly confined group of people who could um, select use cases and instruct models, right, and then test their viability for, for function and for bias and things like that. With generative AI, that function of what we can ask the model to do has been completely distributed. And, and we, so we can all do it, and our kids can do it, and good guys can do it, and bad guys can do it. So, so we have to really think differently now about what, how humans ask questions and what they ask questions about on the one hand. On the other hand, at the end of the process, and this is what I wanted to add to the definition, not so much of AI, but to the systems into which AI is inserted increasingly, is that model, AI, AI models produce outputs. And those outputs, as Meredith said, are basically predictions at this point, most, most, of, most of the AI that we see. What we do with those outputs are what, we, what I call outcomes, right? And how much human, how much distance and how much human sort of packaging and surround that you put around an, a model output will differ by, differ by use case and organization and risk profile and all of those things. So, so humans need to be thinking very much about, are my outputs different than my outcomes here? And if I'm, recommend, if I'm recommending what movie to watch or what shoes to buy or something like that, I probably don't need a lot of distance between the outputs and the outcomes. But if I'm diagnosing a medical condition for a particular patient or under, you know, writing a loan for a particular um, person, then maybe I do need more geometry between my output and my outcome. And that's a very human function to decide that, to perform that, to understand the impact of that. So I would say humans at the beginning and humans at the end at least, and then I would argue all along the way. But, but our role is going to be very integrated into how these tools are used. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. Chris, you said an interesting thing just now, um, that when you set up this organizational structure, and I thought it was fascinating, that you, it's going to be much harder if you're not already focused on ethics and, and things like that. Um, but you said when you set up this structure, there was lots of individuals coming to you saying, hey, I want to set this up, I want to do this, I want to do that. And it's funny, because I've also seen that, I'm sure we all have, there's a race to do all these kind of things. But at the same time, we know the great fear of the employee community is that AI is going to replace my role. <laughs> so on the one hand, they're advocating for it before we're ready. And on the other hand, they're, they're worried about you know, AI actually uh, replacing their role. And I love this phrase that um, I heard from Kay uh, recently, which is of techno chauvinism, which mm -hmm. is this concept that we automatically assume that the technology is going to be better. Um, Meredith, perhaps you can try and tackle that complex topic. Where, where's the reality in terms of how AI uh, should be adopted? Is it something that takes over, or, or what's your view? Well, so techno-chauvinism is a kind of bias. It's a kind of pro-technology bias that says that technological sol solutions are superior to others. Uh, and so instead, what I argue is that uh, we should use the right tool for the task. And sometimes the right tool for the task is absolutely computer, and sometimes it's something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on a parent's lap. Uh, one is not inherently superior to another. It's just about, again, the right tool for the task. So I think that kind of attitude, uh, to me, helps cut through a lot of techno-chauvinism. Uh, Another thing that happens is people imagine that they're going to, uh, to get a lot of status or power from being associated with the latest technological innovation. Uh, and you know, often that does happen, but it doesn't happen with every single one. And you know, often the technological flavor of the month kind of goes kaput, and then you kind of get egg on your face. So 
you know, I think being reasonable about what are the uh, what are the boundaries of the technology is really a good place to hang out. And, and the, does that effectively mean that you're looking for? Yes, it may take over certain functions, but effectively, the role of AI is to assist humans. Is that how you you're seeing it? Absolutely, the role of AI is to assist humans. Uh, people are really scared of artificial intelligence. Uh, I mean, that's why I like to start with definitions. I also like to uh, reassure everybody that AI is not coming to take your job, right? Uh, what we are going to see is we are going to see uh, people using AI, but there is no coming robot apocalypse. Like there is no uh, no world where AI is going to be running everything, and we're just going to sit home and like have our groceries delivered because you know we did that during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And it was awful. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so nobody wants that. And so it's not reasonable to expect that that's what the world is going to turn into. Uh, but uh, it's important to take that fear of AI and, and confront it head on. Like, what are we afraid of? Are we afraid of losing our jobs? Well, then you can reassure people you're not going to lose your job. Uh, but we do want you to use this new tool reasonably. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to try and come up with ways to replace yourself. We just want you to come up with ways to work smarter. Great. And Chris, this reminds me of what you were talking about um, in our uh, Tech Innovation Showcase around our Safe Coder pilot, where, where we introduced the, the, the private AI capability to our developers. And, and actually, they had a very favorable response with it for it specifically as an assistant, not as something that can just automate everything they do, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we took a broad approach to looking at software development internally, where we initially looked at public cloud services. And for VMware, our source code is our business. We're a software company. And it's very important for us to make sure that we're maintaining privacy and control of that data, because that's, it defines our business. So we look to open source and a service now that we've worked with through Hugging Face to be able to uh, take a model that's trained on permissively licensed code, and uh, we were able to then tune the model against our own private source code. And, uh, and we were very selective about how we tune the model. We weren't just looking at the entirety of our source code, our C code in particular. Uh, we looked at who are some of our top performing software engineers, and let's look at their code commits, and let's just use that as the data set to tune the model. So that way, we had really good quality code base in terms of tuning the model. And the result was uh, the automation would even do our, our, our style for commenting. It, it had uh, really good contextual awareness of, of how to uh, further assist our software engineers. And uh, the net result was uh, we had roughly 80 software engineers in the pilot, and more than 90% want to continue using the tool, which to me was just a remarkable number. Uh, we found that the uh, bringing on a, and I think the other uh, meta point here was, we didn't just try to throw a large language model at a, a finite problem. We deliberately went and sought out a model that was tuned specifically for software development. That's, that, that was the whole premise of the model itself. So that also helped us to get far more accurate results uh, the fact that we took an open source route also means that we still can maintain uh, some uh, control of the direction of how we're going to do our own software development. We're not beholden to some type of proprietary technology uh, as well. So we were able to achieve great results, see better productivity, see great satisfaction with the software engineers who did see it as an assist to them. And uh, it's, this is something now that we're continuing to grow internally uh, because we've had such good success. But we were very deliberate about uh, you know, what not to do and what to do, and then mindful of partnering with our legal teams to ensure that everything that we were doing was going to be uh, uh, in compliant with our own corporate policies. Super, thank you. And, and just as a reminder, there, there is time uh, at the end of the session. We'll have 10 minutes for uh, Q&A. We'll have microphones in the room, and we'll be taking some from online. Um, shifting slightly, um, Karen, a, a couple of the areas, uh, or the many areas that, that you focus on, uh, one with your legal background, and two, your working setting up these, uh, you know, these policy approaches and things with, with organizations. Um, 
we've just heard about taking measured approaches, but obviously there are going to be people that are going to go a lot faster. Um, we've also, in just this discussion here, have been talking about how nascent our understanding is of where all this goes. Um, what responsibilities should the humans in those organizations be taking to, to, as a baseline to start saying, you know, here's what I really need to think about? And, and in that sense, I'm thinking if, if AI is, is always about the, the mathematics and the data, right, then actually organizations by and large have a fairly evolved set of data controls and policies. But anyway, <laughs> depends on the. <laughs> um, but you know, is is that the right starting point to think that actually, you know, my data policy should involve? Or is there some other approach on how you stop putting yourself at significant risk here? Yeah. So uh, there's not enough time on the. <laughs> you know, but but yeah, I, I think it starts at the top. Like I love what I'm hearing here because it's it's measured and so for instance, one of the things we know is that that the tools that are available today are really powerful for um, accelerating and advancing and sometimes improving the performance of repetitive process or processes that we understand really well, we know what good looks like, and we know how to validate against the model's performance. We know how to identify when the model starts to drift or degrade because we just, we, we we not only know what we expect to see, but we have a lot of confidence in what we expect to see. And benchmarking against like high quality engineers is a really good place to start. But I think the role, what's interesting about this time is that everybody on the planet is anxious about this, right? Or, and, and I mean that anxious in an excited way and anxious in a nervous way. And everybody on the planet has to develop their own relationship to this technology and, and personal ethics around how to use it, when to use it, how to supervise my kids using it, how to manage my employees who are using it, how to, you know, at, at every level. And so the first thing we all need to do is take a deep breath, honestly, and, and start to, and to internalize that a lot of these tools while they're going to help us with things like repetitive process and drafting first drafts of things that are exciting and new, um, these tools are also going to require a lot more cognitive work from all of us because we're going to have to evaluate what is good, what does good look like, is this a good example of that, um, is this trustworthy, is this information or disinformation, where does the information come from? Asking a million questions, not only of the outputs, like I said, but asking a million questions of the model so that we're tuning the outputs that we're getting, right? And so I think we all need to, the, the place that I would start is, is take a deep breath, um, sort out where you really think these technologies are going to help you in your daily life, whether that's your personal daily life or your corporate daily life, and is, are there repetitive processes that you'd like to do away with, do faster, do better? Um, are there creative projects that you would like support with and help with? Um, and, and they each suggest different kinds of what I call sort of personal governance. Right? On the repetitive process, we're testing against known standards. Like on the creative side, we're testing against a much more ethically ambiguous space, right? Like, am I doing, am I creating something for art or am I creating something to launch an adversarial attack on somebody else's network or environment? And, and I think you also mentioned that you brought your CISO in right away or that that was a joint mm -hmm. effort. Again, best practice, right, is that this is also a team sport. And so as humans, we have to start assembling without a lot of, um, we have to get over the orthodoxy of how some of our information and organizational flows have worked, and we have to sort of break down silos around um, security, privacy, certainly compliance and ethics, but also strategy, revenue, education, training. I mean, we could just go down the list, right? So we have to sort of start thinking creatively, accept that this is going to take more, not less work from us, I mean, just at the, the brain function. Um, and start to map this moment onto your specific environments in a thoughtful sort of, um, the, the same way that you would consider 
I mean, for lack of a better word, like buying a new car. What are the features you want it to have? Where are you going? Why are you using the car? Is it your kid's car? Is it your car? Is it your weekend fun car? Or is it your haul the kids around car? Right, I mean, just really start thinking about these as tools, tools that we're gonna integrate and tools that we're gonna have to learn how to drive and manage and not run over for the people with. Mm. And, and I, I, one of the interesting things I find with some of the kind of, there's so much regulatory change, so many fresh legal challenges. We, we wait every week for the latest Supreme Court judgment on what does this mean, what is that? So it's a massively changing landscape. Um, but you know, I, I guess organizations need to really be careful not to be naive about their responsibilities in this space. Um, one observation I've seen is that I think people are beginning to get their heads around they can't, uh, you know, that they are responsible to make to try and make sure that this thing is is behaving in, in uh, appropriate ways. But also, they've got to be ready to be able to defend if somebody accuses them that it's not done what it should be doing in an ethical way, like if it's using gender bias or if it's using something like that. Like. Is, is that a real problem that we're already seeing or is that you know, still to come? Yes, we're seeing it. And we're seeing it in lots of different forms. One is, um, again, are the outputs biased for some reason, either because the question at the beginning was poorly formed, the data they used and coded the bias to begin with, or the math was just skewed in some way. Bias can happen all those places. It can also happen in that distance between outputs and outcomes. Right. Right, so, so where there's bias, we have to be very clear-eyed and non-defensive about how did, it, how did it happen, where did it come from, and how do we mitigate against it, right? And in order to do that, you have to have pretty good understanding of that workflow and documentation. And you want to do that in a way that your lawyers aren't going to pass out at the end when, when they see what you've written down. Right, and so it, so it really is a thought, it, 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 this, this has to be a thoughtful incremental exercise. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the other dimension of this problem, which we're not talking about yet, and this room in particular might be interested in, is the disinformation problem. And, the, and that comes from a couple different places. Sometimes it's intentional disinformation, you know, where, where there's just humans are trying to fabricate content. Um, Sometimes it's, it's a byproduct of how these, particularly the generative AI systems work. I, I don't love the word you know, hallucination, but that's what we all seem to be using. Um, and again, the hallucinations can come from lots of different places in the system. So having, I, I think companies, we'll just stick with corporates for a second. Corporates have to defend not only against accu accurate allegations of improper bias or performance or drift or any of those things, but also against inaccurate acquisitions of these sorts of things. And so it's a very complex landscape. The other cohort that I would bring in earlier rather than later is your internal communications team, because you can have the best policies in the world if you can't explain them to your employees, your customers, and your regulators, and your underwriters, and all those, you're, you're sort of stuck. So, so this really is a team sport, it's a thoughtful sport, and it's gonna, the best companies are thinking about this in a whiteboard kind of new way, mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you, know, you take your old policies and you graph stuff on, but, but, but being ready to see this in a brand new way. Yeah, very interesting area. Uh, we, we touched on two massive topics in those responses uh, that could be sessions or days even on their own. Um, but maybe, maybe we can just touch on them. No, no, that was in addition to what you're talking about. And maybe we can just touch on them uh, briefly here. Uh, Meredith, you're, you've done a tremendous amount of work on looking at these issues around bias. Um, you know, I, I, when we were chatting earlier, I recently had a very real experience as I was making some presentations here for, for the event, um, and, it, and it's quite shocking. What advice can you give people to how should you as an organization, whether it's by a use case or across your organization as a whole, what can you do um, to help with bias, and what should we all be doing as an industry to, to help with this challenge? Well, I think that uh, there are two things to keep in mind. One is uh, an idea from Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology, and that's the idea that technology discriminates by default. Right? So for many years, we've had this perception, or this you know, techno-chauvinist bias that because we're doing things with technology, it's going to be objective or neutral or unbiased. That is not true at all. Uh, 
AI systems, automated systems discriminate by default. So it's not a question of if it's happening, it's a question of how is it happening and to what degree is it illegal or unethical, right? So all of these systems discriminate, they're all biased, that's just how they work. Uh, and that, like we need to sit with that for a second and sit with that discomfort. Uh, as, uh, as Karen said, like this is, like these are hard conversations. Uh, and you need to kind of confront the reality of, okay, we're going to have to have hard conversations about race, about gender, about disability in the office. And these are, these are things we kind of tend to not talk about in offices, right? But uh, we need to have these hard conversations. So it's happening, uh, pretending that it's not happening is not doing us any favors. Uh, so discrimination is happening. Well, how do we figure out what kind of discrimination is happening? Well, start with the illegal stuff, right? There's plenty of, there's plenty of bad stuff out there, but start with the most illegal stuff, right? Uh, so uh, you know, discrimination based on protected categories. Uh, so race, gender, ability status, uh, national origin, sexuality, et cetera. Uh, and look at what are the, uh, what do the social scientists know about how discrimination and bias works? Uh, and then look at how could that be operating inside technological systems? Uh, so a couple of examples that I wrote about in my most recent book are the example of mortgage approval algorithms. Um, and actually, let me just start there. So mortgage approval algorithms, the markup did a big investigation into mortgage approval algorithms. And what they found was that mortgage approval algorithms were, uh, I think it was 40 to 80% more likely to deny borrowers of color as opposed to their white counterparts. Right. Why is this? Well, let's look at the data that was used to feed the mortgage approval models. Well, fed it with data about who's gotten mortgages in the past in the United States. The United States has a very long history of financial discrimination, of uh, bias in uh, residential lending. We have residential segregation. All of that bias is being fed into the model, and it's not surprising that the model is making biased decisions, okay? What we can do is we can put our finger on the scale mathematically, and we can look at, okay, uh, you know, what is the uh, distribution by race of who's being approved for a mortgage and who isn't, and then we can tweak the model's outputs mathematically to make it more fair, right? But we need to admit, that the first step is we need to admit that there's a problem, and then we need to put our finger on the scale, and uh, this is kind of difficult for people to do, especially in a heavily regulated industry like mm -hmm. finance. Uh, so there are, uh, as Karen mentioned, there are regulatory, regulators are starting to talk about this, uh, and uh, there is some guidance out there, uh, but we really need better uh, wide-scale implementation of it. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention is algorithmic auditing. Uh, algorithmic auditing is the process of looking at an algorithm and evaluating it for bias. Uh, Kathy O'Neill, who wrote Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, has a, an algorithmic auditing firm uh, that I've actually done a little bit of work with. Uh, and one of the questions that they ask is, uh, what keeps you up at night? Or you know, what could possibly go wrong? Because everybody has a dread, has a secret dread about what could possibly be wrong with their products, that's a really good starting place. Like, what is your worst case scenario? And let's see to what extent that's actually happening. And usually it's not as bad as you think. And it can be, it can often be mitigated. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So again, the humans making those deliberate interventions to, to at least try to, to stop these issues. Chris, in, in, um, in your work, um, the considerations of bias, um, but also the fact that we have this, these challenges around model decay, model drift. Um, how much did, did they factor into how you approach things at VMware? 
Yeah, yeah, so a great, great question. And, you know, really to, to, to Meredith's point, you know, we can do some work to adjust model weights to help with bias, but that's, that doesn't really go far enough. And, and, uh, and also to her point around data sources is, this is, I think, one of the challenges that we have uh, today in the industry and in, in technology is that for most of the models that are available today, the data sources are considered proprietary. And uh, it's hard for me to fully understand where bias can come from in a model when I don't see the data that it's being used to train on. So uh, we've been looking more and, and really promoting more active, I, I think, two, two sides to this. So one is uh, mo uh, models trained on open data sources. Uh, and companies like BMW are doing this today. BMW has open sourced the entirety of its uh, factory data and is encouraging all of its peers in the industry to leverage that to build AI systems to help factories. Right? And that's, BMW is what I'd consider to be like an ethical partner of ours in this journey in terms of really what's necessary for uh, AI and, and what's, the, what's the approach that I would say humans are going to be uh, successful with. You know, the other side of this, you know, back to my earlier point on large models, you know, we've had our engineers work with some of these models in the past and in, in very short period of time with a, a number of prompts, you can start getting the model to communicate to you some very unethical things. And this is, again, if we go back to, you know, what we really believe in is more special purpose, lighter weight, tuned models, that allows you to also handle issues of drift and decay a lot easier. Because the model size is smaller, I don't need a whole lot of compute to, turn, to tune it. And, uh, and I can keep retraining models very frequently. You know, like the large language models, it's months, sometimes years. And you can ask GPT, when was the last time you were trained? And I think the, the, the dates that will uh, come out would probably surprise you. Uh, so, so this is why. September 2021. Right. Yeah. For four, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's what I think is, uh, is, is where we're looking to further guide the industry is lighter weight, special purpose models. And, and not only are you training more frequently, but you are dramatically reducing your carbon footprint. So this is also something that we consider to be uh, sustainability as a part of VMware's approach to AI ethics. And uh, again, smaller models, easier to train, less resources, lower carbon footprint, and they're more accurate as well. So this we see as being a big part of the future. And this is again, you know, when we're talking about private AI, these are the kind of concepts we mean, right? You're controlling your data. You have full awareness of the data being used to influence the model. and. Um, Again, you're able to iterate through these cycles faster without a, a huge impact on the environment as well. So there's, there are good ethical ways to, to move forward with this technology, and that's something that, as a company, VMware is committed to. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I, 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 mean, I, I just want to keep talking, but we, we do need to get to Q&A shortly. Maybe uh, if I could ask you in turn, starting with you, Karen, we've covered a lot of topics just here. We've got a whole range of things. Um, there's obviously a lot of depth to them, but for a lot of people here, you know, they're, they're, they're excited about the new capabilities that have just been unlocked for them. Um, what, what's kind of, for each of you, what's kind of your, your one piece of advice that they, they should definitely do to get starting, just to get started? Yeah, I, I think get really comfortable with questions. The questions that you, that you have and can articulate, questions that other people bring to you even when it slows you down. You know, I think, I think building into our sort of personal governance and corporate governance a, a space for this kind of inquiry and conversation, and as we've talked about sort of, I don't want to say non-defensive, but just sort of open thinking about um, and opportunities for people to um, explore, invent, and, and also then decide collectively what they do and do not want these tools to do in a narrow setting, how to um, protect themselves in a broad setting. I mean, it's, it, it's a complicated analysis, but I think question, I, it all comes back to education and questions, always, um, including the identification of the language problem, which is that we don't have a lot of words yet for the phenomena we're seeing, for the tools we're using, for the impact they're having. So it takes more conversation and more explanation and more time to get on the same page with somebody. Take that time, because, because you'll save yourself a lot of grief in the long run. Super, thank you. Chris? 
Yeah, I, I would just say the uh, advice I would give would be to uh, avoid the temptation of just the quick win, uh, just to try to satisfy some mandate and have a early a success for AI, and, and be mindful of it. So consider an AI platform that has choice built in as a capability. We think that's really important because the space is moving so fast that you know, every week there's new models that are emerging on like the Hugging Face leaderboard as an, as an example. And um, that, what that tells you is that, you know, that the churn of models and innovation is happening so quickly, you really can't just say, I'm gonna just use this one model to solve all of my business problems. So a platform that has, gives you the ability to quickly pivot as better technologies come around, better technologies are models that are more aligned to your business goals and your business ethics, uh, that should be your foundation. So work to lay the AI foundation today and then have optionality in terms of how you can take advantage of that AI foundation going forward. Excellent, thank you. Meredith? I would say that you should assume that there are going to be social problems that manifest inside your AI systems. Uh, and you should also assume that you're going to need to iterate to solve those problems because social problems are really long standing. Uh, we haven't, you know, haven't come up with uh, social fixes for them. So we can't expect that we will lickety split be able to come up with a technological fix. And so iteration when we're dealing with problems of bias uh, is, uh, is also a really effective strategy. Excellent, be, be ready for the many changes <laughs> and, and do it thoughtfully. Uh, superb. So uh, we're at the time for Q&A. We have some uh, microphones here in the room. Uh, it's a wonderful chance to talk to these experts. Um, I, I can't see, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Thank you. Hi. Uh, Alex Williams of the New Stack. Great conversation. You know, one of the things I do pick up on is, like you're saying, ask lots, lots of questions, like discuss, conversation. And these are skill sets that people with liberal arts backgrounds have. And I'm curious about how you think that will reflect on the changing culture of organizations, especially technology organizations, where technology rules and the technologists rule. So I'm just curious on your take on how you think these cultures will change as a result of this need for deeper conversation, deeper introspection, that training that people with backgrounds in the liberal arts actually have. You know? Well, I, I teach in the College of Arts and Sciences at NYU. So I am really enthusiastic about anything that means more jobs for <laughs> liberal arts uh, liberal arts students. Karen, you mentioned questioning earlier as well. Yeah, I, th I think this is one of the, imp when I said that some of the restructuring and you've got to sort of redo, fix the plumbing in a lot of organizations to enable these conversations and the cross-pollination of ideas and worries and solutions and opportunities. I mean, we haven't talked a lot about, because I know you spent the rest of the week talking about it, but. The, the opportunities here are also a team sport, as well as the risk mitigation. So I think, I think there are going to be not just corporate culture implications. I think there'll be corporate structure implications. Um, boards, corporate boards, are going to have to run differently. You you can't do your strategic planning once a year and set your agenda 12 months ahead. So like we, we're going to have to re-plumb a lot of this stuff over time. Some of these are small fixes. Some of them are big fixes. But I think yeah, stay tuned for again, fresh thinking on how organizations and information flow within them need to be structured. Thank you. And, and, their, and then culture that comes from that. And, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always, uh, you know, it's, 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 I think it's a great comment uh, because, you know, as an engineer, you're, and technologists in general, we're, we're trained, our brains are trained more to identify the problem, solve the problem. Right, and to solve the problem might not actually be the right thing to do right now, or you might not be using the right tool. So you have to think about the societal implications, the business implications, the legal implications, the compliance implications. That does require a different skill set. Uh, and, and, and I do agree that we'll see more of that in IT. Even some of the technology that we had uh, previewed this week was showing how to do Python scripting w by just prompting the AI engine. I didn't, I didn't have to have that expertise. It's like, I, I wanna do this. Okay, here's the code to do it. Right? And, and I think that's, that, that definitely starts to change the game. Uh, you know, at, the, at the same time, I, I think that the other more important skill set is to understand context. Because 
if, if AI is assisting us, it does mean the, the human job is to ensure that what the AI is suggesting is correct. And, you know, so there, and that's what we're seeing now. Like I'm sure some of you probably saw the legal filing that happened in New York federal court where case law was made up in the filing, right? And that's something that a attorney should still be checking, right, before the documents are actually filed in the first place. Uh, it, and that's in all careers, right? So there's still going to be, humans are going to still have to supervise AI. And, um, you know, the skill set goes beyond is the information correct, but then what are the other implications of it? Uh, and then always, we, we need to always um, be objective and question the model itself, right? Is, uh, is, is this really the right answer or is this what the model thinks is right? And therefore, is there bias in the data that we need to also be evaluating? Thank you. Seems like a, a key evolution uh, that goes alongside with this is our ability to question and converse, uh, and because there's inefficiencies there today and will will evolve. Wasn't it Einstein who said 99% of the problem is, or, or the work should be on identifying the problem, and right. once you've done, and then it well, wasn't maybe 99, but it was. This yeah. is an age-old problem we're just yeah. revisiting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We have another question. We've got the mic. Oh, hello. I'm Hei Jin Zhang from Seoul Economic Daily. Uh, uh, it was very interesting session. So uh, actually, I'm based in San Jose, uh, but the in Silicon Valley alone, the male Asian or Indian engineers are very pr predominant. So without the uh, so ab in the absence of diversity, how can we recognize bi biased data? and the uh, thinking, especially in the deeper option. Uh, so that's the one question. Uh, second question is to Chris Ulf. Uh, I want to ask you one thing about the, uh, are there any alternatives? Uh, so how can you effectively do unbiased training with the biased data? So I want to ask those two questions. Yeah, so I think that Meredith, uh, like from, from the first point, that there's a good example being raised of where an entire demographic that's core to a use case, uh, there may be significant amounts of bias. So you know, what, what additional steps can we, can we kind of take against that? And then obviously, Chris, if you can expand that into how we did that with our models. Yeah. Meredith? Well, Silicon Valley has a diversity problem. Uh, it has had a diversity problem for a very long time. Uh, and companies have not done enough to meaningfully address it. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's true. Uh, and so one of the uh, most important things that companies can do to make better tech products is to have a greater range of voices in the room when these products are being designed. Uh, so one example of this is the Apple Watch. Uh, when the Apple Watch launched, uh, there was a big hoopla about how it was going to have all of these health applications on it. It was going to help you keep tra better track of your health and you know, be more healthy. But you know what it didn't have when it launched? Anybody remember this? It didn't have a period tracker, right? 50% of people out there are tracking their menstrual cycle as a part of, of monitoring their health. And it would have made a lot more sense to have it as a default something that you have to take off the watch as opposed to making it something that you have to put on. And so if there had been a wider variety of people in the room when the product was being designed and rolled out, uh, well, they probably would have made a different decision. Mm -hmm. right? So there are all kinds of examples like that that can be avoided you know, if you have a greater range of people in the room and you empower people to speak up and you uh, give weight to their opinions, right? Because if somebody speaks up but is not really heard, you know, or the organization says, oh yeah, 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 that's a, that's a concern, but we don't really have time to deal with it, then you know, yep. it's not helping. So Beautiful. have people speak up and empower them. Excellent. And Chris, just briefly, that, like your own approach to removing my I absolutely want to weigh in on this because I, I think we're, uh, we're, we set a very positive example for diversity in tech. Uh, our organization today, so VMware AI Labs, is approximately 35% women. 
and uh, between women and what we would define as underrepresented minorities, we're nearly 50% of our organization. And I know that's not uh, quite normal, uh, but it's something that we have worked very, very hard on over many years. And uh, today, under me, we have three innovation work streams, research, incubation, and advanced development. Research and advanced development are both led by very accomplished women. So my leadership team is, is very strong in terms of very technically accomplished uh, women leaders. And for us though, and I think this is the challenge that folks have with diversity is that they, they, they look at solving, quote, solving diversity as like this issue of leadership. Like if I just hire diverse leaders then I solve the problem and that's not the case. You have to build a pipeline of talent at all levels of the organization so that people with all of different backgrounds are seeing that if I come into this organization, I have leaders at all levels that look like me, came from places where I came from, and I'm seeing all of these people around me also getting career advancement. And uh, that's a brand that we have built over, uh, I'm saying brand because that's we use it for hiring, but I would, the, the appropriate word is culture. This is a culture we have built over many years and even as the company has reorged and my organization had become less diverse, people would ask me, well, what are you gonna do? I would say, we're fine, because we already did the hard part, which was changing the culture. So uh, some of the challenges that other technical organizations have, I would say we don't have here uh, because of that. And these are things we're very mindful of. And we don't just look at our approach to say AI and AI research in a, a vacuum. Uh, Sujata Banerjee, who leads our research team, uh, we work very deliberately with external academic organizations in collaboration on all things we do across the technology spectrum. And that's also helping us to make sure that we're not like uh, having group think. We have an entire team of uh, C what we call CTO ambassadors, and these are 200 people globally in the VMware field that are also constantly taking our ideas to customers testing them and bringing feedback back to us and connecting us to those customers so we can hear it also firsthand. So we're, we're very concerned about knowing what we don't know and uh, always trying to challenge our own assumptions. And, and that has been, uh, all of those types of traits I'd say have been very valuable uh, to us. But um, yeah, I, I could talk about, I, I, <laughs> diversity is something that is very personal to me and I can spend hours on it, so let me just stop. I know we have limited time. Yeah, I'm, and, and I'm conscious there's a lot of eager hands in the room, and I, I just want to apologize because we are out of time. I love that there's so much interest in this topic. You know, so I, I think, um, you know, thank you everyone for your amazing insights. We, we are on the cusp of something absolutely enormous here, and, it, and it's tremendously exciting. And the, the upside um, for organizations and their business drivers, but also for societal good, I think is there, uh, and we all want to seize it. But as we're hearing you just, uh, from the advice, you know, we just need some of those core tenets of discipline. I love this idea to assume it's wrong, assume there are problems with it, and fix those. And maybe we'll fix a whole bunch of other issues while we're doing so. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And thank the panel. If you hadn't been doing these things for years, we wouldn't have your uh, insight and expertise. So thank you for bringing that to this group. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you.